Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the ideal list of Haydn oratorios. Now, I know you think there aren't that many Haydn oratorios, and one of you suggested that I do this, and I said, oh, but there aren't so many of them. But actually, there are enough. There are enough to do an ideal list with a little, a little freedom. There are five. I mean, actually five. Most people only know about the creation and the seasons. But I consider, I consider it a little bit more um, loosely than that. And these works, I you know, might as well call them oratorios. Why? Why not? Well, there is definitely at least one more. Well, two more. Well, three more. Five. There you go. So we're going to talk about all five. And remember, as with all of these idealists, the concept here is not to tell you what is the best or my favorite. It's among the best. Everything is among the best. There are no weak links in any of these of these performances, and you're going to get to know some really extraordinary, unfamiliar music. And if you don't know all of the Haydn choral music, you know, as well as you should. So let's just get started with the five. The first and the earliest comes from 1767, and it's Haydn's Stabat Mater. Most people do not know this work at all, but it is extraordinary. First of all, um, you know, Haydn wrote it as a thank offering to the Virgin Mary after recovering from an illness, as often happens or happened in those days. And so he was very, very serious about it. And in fact, he took the manuscript and sent it to Hasse. Hasse, you know, the great opera Syria Baroque composer guy from Dresden. And Hasse adored it and gave Haydn a very, very enthusiastic testimonial which Haydn kept for, you know, his entire career, basically. But it's an amazing work. It's 70 minutes long. That means it is the largest Stabat Mater setting in existence before Dvorak's. I mean, that's really, it's really an amazing thing, and it may still be one of the top two or three. It's a very, very intricate, rich, deep work. And more than that, note the date, 1767. This is the, al the onset um, of Haydn's Sturm und Drang period, when he was starting to explore, you know, the, 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 the power of minor keys. And of course, this text, which is about, you know, the Virgin Mary sitting at the foot of the crucified Jesus and weeping and, and suffering, I mean, really, really suits minor keys. There, there weren't that many uh, settings like this. I mean, there just weren't. There was Pergolesi, and, you know, there's there are some other beautiful ones. I mean, there's Boccherini wrote a lovely Stabat Mater, twice, actually, two arrangements of it. But but this is, is on a totally different scale from anything that came before. And people don't give Haydn any credit for that. You know, Haydn gets credit for being succinct and funny and instrumental and usually not grand in scale. I mean, that epithet is reserved for Mozart mostly because Mozart was definitely grand in scale. He really was. But Haydn could be as well. And he was most likely to be grand in scale in his vocal music and in his sacred music. And this is one of the biggest of all of them. It's an amazing work. It has, it has, let me see, it's got 13 numbers and they're beautifully arranged. There are five choruses and seven arias and one duet. So the duet as you might expect, is one of the longest numbers. It's Sancta Mater, is the text, Holy Mother. And it's the exact centerpiece of the, of the work. And the choruses and duets are otherwise arranged reasonably symmetrically around the rest of it. The opening Stabat Mater Dolorosa chorus is nine minutes long. This is not a little, little, little sequence of, of, of unimportant hoochie-goochies. It's really, really a big work. And that's why I call it an oratorio. 70 minutes, okay. That it gets to, I mean, we, you could call it a cantata, I suppose. But let's, let's put it in with the oratorios, because otherwise it's just going to get lost in the shuffle. And it doesn't deserve to be. It's one of the great early masterpieces that Haydn wrote, and one of his earliest masterpieces in the field of sacred music. And, and in the sacred music of the period, there's nothing to compare to it. 
So there you go. And this performance is Trevor Pinnock with the English Concert and Choir, and it is splendiferous. The soloists are Patricia Rosario and Catherine Robin and Anthony Rolf Johnson and Cornelius Hauptmann. I mean, you know who most of these people are, and you know they sing very well, and the performance is really, really super. And get to know this piece. You, you owe it to yourself to hear it. It's extraordinary. It really is. So that's number one. Number two is a true oratorio. It's Il Ritorno di Tobia, or Tobias's Return. Now, you know the story of Tobit, don't you? all know that one, right? From the Apocrypha. And, you know, it's actually sort of the same as El Amor Brujo, only with religious overtones. Elamor Brujo is about a girl who can't get married because the ghost of her dead lover is, you know, frightening away or threatening to kill all of the suitors that come for her. Well, this is quite similar. What happens in this one is that, is that Tobit is, has been blinded and he's a really nice guy and he sends his son Tobias to go to whatever, whatever town it is um, to collect some money or something like that. And he meets Rebecca. And Rebecca is being harassed by the demon Asmodeus or whatever, you know, is as one of those demon things that's killing all of the men who want to make out with her. But Tobias is a very sincere, sweet, holy, nice person. And together working with with the, the, the archangel, some other archangel. <laughs> Let me see, maybe he's in here. Is he in here too? But Raphael, yeah, the Raphael, the archangel Raphael, who's a soprano. They they chase away um, the evil demon and, uh, you know, Tobias marries Rebecca and they come back, that's the return part, to see Tobit and his blindness is healed and everybody praises God a lot. And it's really, really long. This thing, this sucker is three discs and it lasts a solid, solid, well, it's 10 minutes shy of three hours. Two hours and 50 minutes. It's, it's, you know, there's not that many recordings of this. There's the Dorati, which is actually a good three hours. Now, Haydn wrote the piece in 1775, and then it was for the Tonkunstler Society in Vienna, you know, the Society for the Widows and Orphans of Musicians. So it was for a benefit. And that man, he took a great deal of time with it and care, and it was extremely successful. But immediately, because it was written in the old oratorio tradition with mostly arias, mostly da capo arias, some of which are unbelievably long and very beautiful. I mean, it's good music. And nowadays, you know, we don't really care because we like da capo arias. We like Baroque opera. The period instrument people have restored to favor a lot of music in this style, but not Haydn's. Of course, it's like the stop at modern. Nobody thinks about it. But then he revised it for a performance in 1784 where he tightened it up a bit. Can you imagine tightening it up to only a little bit less than three hours? And he added some, some really fabulous choruses. I mean, first class choruses that, you know, just two of them, I believe, that really, but really matter. I mean, they are pillars of the work and, you know, created greater contrast and variety. And that's the form we know it in now. There was a further revision by Haydn's pupils, uh, what was his name, Newcomb, um, in like, you know, 18 something. But essentially, this is the form, Haydn's revised version. And it's an extraordinary piece. This performance is on Naxos, and it features the vocal ensemble Köln, the Capella Augustina under Andreas Sperring, who also did a fabulous performance of the creation. It's not going to be in this list, but it's really great. And it was in my talk on Haydn's creation. So there you go. And the soloist, oh my goodness, Roberta Inverdnitzi. Do you know who she is? She does a lot of those, those Handel cantatas on various, you know, Glossa and other labels like that. And, and she's a wonderful singer a fantastic Baroque singer, and Sophie, Sophie Kartheuser and Anna Hollenberg, who Anne Hollenberg, pardon me, is very well known, Anders Dahlen tenor and Nikolai Borchev bass. Beautiful performance, wonderfully done on period instruments. And it, it's another piece that, I mean, yes, it's long, but Handel oratorios are long. I mean, they're long, you know? I mean, it's long, who cares? If you have the time, give it a shot. You're going to be very favorably impressed because the music is top quality absolutely top quality. And the arguments about it being long and old fashioned and all that, they just don't wash anymore. Thank you, period instrument people, for proving that works in this style can be absolutely thrilling. 
and this is. So there you go. Next, well, we're not quite at the two late ones yet, but we're moving along and we can move a little more quickly as a result of that. There is the seven last words of the Savior on the cross. Now, this is the oratorio version because, as you may know, Haydn originally wrote it as an orchestral work, and that's the way I prefer it. It's a fabulous orchestral work. It's one of his grandest and longest, I mean, it's an hour long, you know, greatest pieces of orchestral music. But it was so overwhelmingly popular that it was arranged for piano solo, it was arranged for string quartet by Haydn. The piano version wasn't, but it was authorized by him. And then some guy made a vocal version of it. With a, you know, and it, Haydn heard it. He said it was horrible. He said, "Stop! If I don't do it myself, they're going to be playing this crappy version made by this, 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 this no one." So Haydn did his own, and it, it, you know, it, 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 it. What can I say? I like the orchestral version better. Now this is beautifully written. I mean, the vocal parts, it's fascinating. He just sort of plonked them on top of the orchestral version. But he added, he made it an oratorio in two parts. And he included between the two parts a really fascinating, somewhat grim, <laughs> moody and atmospheric wind band solo for a huge wind orchestra. He added more instruments when he did this. You know, you get timpani, you get trombones, you get stuff. And so he used this enormous wind band and wrote this amazing wind band interlude, a totally separate movement. And so it's really a different work in that sense. And this is Nicholas Harnoncourt's performance. It's just wonderful with the Arnold Schoenberg Choir and Consentus Musicus Wien and Inga Nielsen and Margareta Hintermeyer, Hintermeyer, yes, and Anthony Rolf Johnson. We know him. He was just here on the Stabat Mater and Robert Hull. So, yeah. An amazing work, an amazing performance, and, and definitely an oratorio. So that's three before we even got to the two biggies. But now here they are. So let's talk about them, and we are all set. First, the creation. My, my choice for this one is, uh, I love this performance. This is on period instruments as well. It's with Thomas Hengelbrock and the Balthasar Neumann Choir and Ensemble. It was part of this big Deutsche Harmonium Mundi box. And I'm not sure if it's available separately anymore, but like his B minor mass and the other things in here, they were an extraordinary group. I mean, they play marvelously. They have a wonderful timbre. They don't sound thin and emaciated. And maybe because he lets them use a little vibrato, who knows? The singing is fabulous. The Baldazar Neumann Choir is one of the great choirs. It's a tremendous performance of the creation. And I, I could probably tell you who the soloists are if I could find it. Um, wait a minute. Give me a moment here. It's like it's like disc 11, I think, right? Wasn't it? It's like 11 and 12. So this must be it right there. Uh, yeah. Here it is, Haydn, the creation. Oh yeah, Simone, Simone Kermes and Dor Dorothee Mields and Steve Dav Davislam. Oh yeah, Davislam and Johannes Manoy and Lucky Chung. And they all sound great. It's a fabulous performance, take my word for it. And we've done a lot of talk about the creation, so I don't really need to go into it in that much more detail, only to say that it's absolutely one of the most perfect of all the versions out there. And finally, we come to the seasons. Now, the seasons, of course, gets less play than the creation because it, the creation is a major biblical story and the seasons is a pastoral. Um, you know, Charles Rosen called it heroic pastoral, which is really what it is. It's heroic and it's pastoral. But, you know, what we forget about these pieces, the creation and the seasons, again, is that they are certainly indicative of Haydn's grandeur I mean, he wrote them in the wake of Handel. The, the creation was written to be played by hundreds of people with an orchestra where everything was doubled and tripled. I mean, a huge ensemble. And the, and the Seasons is even bigger. The Seasons was, I think, the largest piece of normative choral slash instrumental music before Berlioz. I mean, it's bigger than anything Beethoven did. The orchestra is bigger than that of the Mrs. Solemnis or the Ninth. You know, it's really, really big, and I didn't wear my tie just for that one mention, I know, but I just wanted to get past it, so there you go. But it's it's absolutely um, extraordinary. It consists, it has four horns, three trumpets, three trombones, contrabassoon, piccolo, extra percussion, 
And the extra percussion is interesting. Usually it's tambourine and triangle, but the Viennese parts use full Turkish complement, that is cymbals, bass drum, and triangle, and other stuff. So you may hear it either way. But the fascinating thing about it is that the parts are like those of the creation, and they survive. They show that this work was enormous. It had three contrabassoon parts in it. You know, and they're all different, supposedly. You know, it indicate, you know, when the full group plays, when lesser people play, it, it was really big. Double timpani, double brass, incredible. So the performance I chose is really the best of all of those echt Viennes performances. Karl Böhm. You know, Karl Böhm was, this is one of his sort of like wonderful specialties that he did amazingly well and that that, you know, people don't remember that he did these things and that people think of him as sort of a stodgy, stuffy, you know, German guy. But he was a wonderful, theatrical, fabulous Mozartian, and he was a wonderful, fabulous, theatrical Haydn the Seasons. And this is just a delicious performance. It features the Vienna Symphoniker, not the Philharmoniker, but, you know, they're, v they're Wieners. The Wieners, it doesn't matter whether they're symphonikers or philharmonikers or schnitzels, they're Wieners, and that's what matters. And you've got Gundula Janowitz, Peter Schreier, Marty Talvala. I mean, come on! You are never going to get a better bunch of soloists. The pacing is wonderful. The, the sound is big and rich and full and modern, because this is a modern work. The treatment of the orchestra is modern. The style of it, the, 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 the aesthetic is fundamentally modern. The, the tone painting, the hunting choruses, the storm choruses, all of the stuff that Haydn put into it, it really, it really is, a, a, in essence, a summary of everything that the classical orchestra could do, and, uh, uh, and it points the way forward far, far into the 20th century. In fact, the horn calls in the hunting choruses are the same horn calls that Respighi uses in Festa Romana. I mean, how do you like that from 1920-something? You know, and then the chord call. They were still recalled by Respighi in Festa Romana, but you hear it in the hunting chorus here from 1803 or whenever it was, 1801, something like that. It's extraordinary. I think it's a far more modern piece than anything Beethoven wrote in many ways in terms of the handling of the, the instrumental forces. Really an exceptional piece, and this is a wonderful performance. It deserves a modern presentation. I have not heard a period instrument performance that does it justice. I mean, there's Gardner, who's very good. There's Jacob, who's very good. There's the one in the Naxo set that's okay. But I really think the piece needs a... a a pedal to the metal modern performance to really demonstrate what it's all about. And that, my friends, is the fifth of the five Haydn oratorios in this ideal list. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've seen some pieces that maybe you didn't expect and that you'll give them a listen. Keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care. <laughs>